Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Um, hi, I'm Christine. I'm an alcoholic. Um, wow, this meeting has gotten really full. Um, Online groups, my home group, they is my sponsor. Um, my sobriety date is September 19th, 2003. Uh, I'm living in steps 10, 11, and 12, and I'm revisiting step two. Um, and it's always really an honor and privilege to do service at any meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, so I guess a little bit on what it was like and, and what happened and what it's like now. Um, I don't know. You know, I've, I've heard people say that alcoholism is a threefold disease. It's a mental obsession, a spiritual malady, and a physical allergy. And um, I, I think in the beginning when I first came into the program, I didn't really understand what that meant. But I, I think I, I sort of have a better grasp of that now. Um, you know, they say, like, those of us who are alcoholics tend to feel restless, irritable, and discontent. And I think I've always sort of felt that sort of apartness. Um, just, you know, even growing up, uh, you know, I've always kind of felt like there was sort of like glass pane between me and other people, and I can never really kind of breach that glass and, and, and connect with other people. And um, I, I was at a meeting earlier today, uh, at a beginner's meeting, and um, someone was there who said, you know, he drank to get normal, and I really identified with that. Because um, I, I think even before I picked up a drink, you know, I found different ways to get out of myself. Um, in the beginning, you know, it was just, you know, just sleeping in late, just kind of checking out, like, you know, throwing myself into school, just doing other things because I didn't know how to operate in the world. Um, and, uh, you know, I think when I finally found alcohol, it was really like, it was like this kind of warmth that just kind of, just kind of sat down and just made me feel at ease. And, um, I had never had that feeling before. Um, and I didn't really pick up a drink until I got to college. Um, I'm originally from Southern California, and uh, just kind of growing up throughout my childhood, it was, it was fairly tumultuous. Um, and I think for a long time, when I first came into the program, I really blamed that that part of my life as, as being the root cause of my alcoholism. But you know, the Sunday meeting, if you were if you were there, the topic was, you know, <clears throat> we like the effect produced by alcohol, and, and I completely believe that's the case for me. Like I have a sister who went through her own tumultuous childhood, and she's not an alcoholic. Um, I think. I, you know, just not to get too much into the drinking story, but just to qualify a little bit. Um, <clears throat> I remember <clears throat> when I first arrived um, to college, uh, you know, I, I just drank alcoholically from the get-go. You know, just couldn't get into my body fast enough. Just couldn't party hard enough. And, and, and it really worked for me. You know, it was work hard, play hard, and I didn't see anything wrong with it. Um, I remember a couple months into school, you know, just drinking with a bunch of people, just pounding vodka. And, uh, and at the end of it, um, I apparently was sitting on the windowsill and, and I, and I went into a blackout. And as I was falling forward, I kind of took out the alarm clock and the fridge and the lamp. And, um, people, people dragged me from that room, you know, down the hall, two flights of stairs, down two flights of stairs and into my dorm room and just kind of put me to bed. Um, but they noticed as they were putting me to bed, I was puking in my sleep. And, you know, if I ever forget that this is a, a disease that's fatal, like I just have to think about that. Cause a lot of us just go back out on something really, trivial or seemingly trivial as puking while we're passed out. And um, I think for the first couple of years, drinking was really fun and it got me out of myself and, and kind of through that glass pane that I couldn't, you know, just, I just couldn't relate to people and just everyone seemed to get it but me. And, um, and, and, and drinking, you know, it, I drank to get normal, you know, and uh, it, it really felt that way for a while. Um, <clears throat> at the end of my junior year, I was, seeing a counselor. Actually, I'd been seeing counselors pretty much ever since middle school, just various on and off reasons, because it was that whole thing of, like, if you had my life, you'd drink like I would. Um, and, and I've come to realize that's not a unique experience. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but I, I remember this counselor was the first to ask me, if, you know, how much did I drink a night? And um, and I couldn't really answer her anis- honestly. I couldn't answer her honestly, because I just didn't know. Um, and I think I gave a rough estimate of, like, you know, maybe five drinks a night, three or four nights a week, and she promptly suggested that that's binge drinking. And I didn't see it as that, because I put myself with other people who drank like I did. 
um, and so it seemed like normal behavior. Uh, I guess just to kind of fast forward a little bit, um, <clears throat> that summer I was I was tutoring some students, and it, I remember that being the first time I had ever laughed um, without drinking, and it was the first time I ever felt good about any of the actions I had done because. I was a blackout drinker, and you know my my behavior in a blackout or just drunk really ran the gamut of, you know, just funny or embarrassing or sometimes violent or you know just doing inappropriate things with inappropriate people, not knowing how I got home, just really unsafe, dangerous behavior. Um, <clears throat> and 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 that summer really kind of woke me up. You know, I had. I had gone into blackouts and woke up in bathtubs and people checking my pulse throughout the night because they didn't know if I was alive and none of that woke me up for whatever reason these kids that I was tutoring did. And, um, you know, the fourth year started and I started just drinking every day for a week um, because I just couldn't party hard enough. And at the end of it, I just realized, like, I just can't do this anymore because I was afraid I had done something really inappropriate with one of my students. And um, I ended up going onto the Internet to try to find AA because I wasn't quite ready to ask for help. And uh, I come to realize that the woman in the chat room actually just 12-stepped me. All she did was share her experience, strength, and hope. And she kept me on that online long enough so that I didn't go out that night. <clears throat> and she convinced me that, or she just shared enough that I was kind of curious about AA. So I, I went to um, a meeting on campus, and uh, I remember just being like, oh, my God, I'm 21. And I'm, and I'm in New York, and it's like everything I want. You know, I want to drink as hard as I can and party as hard as I can because I can, and the access is here, and maybe I think I have a problem. And, um, and you know, the, the women in that meeting were about my age, and I'm really grateful for that because I really think our higher power puts us in a place where we need to be. And they just took me under their wing and, and just suggested I do 90 meetings in 90 days. And I didn't know why I did it. I didn't, I didn't even know people got sober in AA. I thought it was like group therapy. Um, so I was really shocked when I heard this one girl had like seven years and was 27. This one girl was 19 and had two years. I just didn't get it. I didn't know anybody who was an alcoholic in my life. And, um, you know, I did 90 meetings in 90 days, not because I, I wanted to get sober. I was just desperate. And, um, and at the end of it, you know, I was so ready to go back out because I wanted to say, I did it your way. It didn't work. Bye. You know, and at the end of 90 days, I got to that and was like, I don't know what it is, but there's something kind of real and there's something kind of good and I don't want to lose it. Um, I had a real hard time with step one. I couldn't admit to myself that I was an alcoholic until I had six months of sobriety. And all I did was literally just show up to meetings and just, you know, I think everyone's strength was, and hope was really what kept me here. And the fact that I could relate to different alcoholics, because I just have never met anybody who could get the way I think, you know, like someone in the meeting today earlier was like, you know, I want more, I want it my way, and I want it faster. And I'm like, yes, um, I get that, you know, and, and, and sometimes I'll tell my friends and they don't really get it. You know, sometimes I say like, I want to die. And they're like, do you need help? I'm like, no, I do get help. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I guess I, I want to get kind of to the steps because that's really where the program of recovery is. And actually my first meeting at Atlanta Group, I heard two speakers, one who, a woman my age and one who's a 30-minute speaker. And the 30-minute speaker said something really simple. It's, you know, get a sponsor, get a home group, get a commitment, work the big book, work the steps. And for whatever reason, I, it, it actually registered in my thick head because I came in with such pride. And, you know, I was kind of that person sitting in the back row with a hoodie and a visor because you couldn't tell me how to live my life. Um, and the steps have really just changed. You know, I, I was thinking today, like, I don't know if I could share because I don't remember what it was like when I was drinking. You know, I just, I don't remember the loneliness, that, that sense of, you know, I, I want to die but don't know how. Like, life is not good drunk, life is not good sober, you know? And, um, and amends, you know, I know I'm kind of fast forwarding a little bit, but going through my nine step amends was really powerful because I hadn't lived with my parents since I was 12. I started living with my sister then. And my sister and I had a really bad falling out when I was 16. This has nothing to do with my alcoholism, but it does, give me an example that the steps really work. And, um, you know, I made amends to them after I had a year of sobriety. I hadn't gone back to California in two years. And, you know, literally just amends that took anywhere between seven minutes and 70 minutes melted away years of just utter pain. And these are the things that are blocking me from the sunlight of the spirit and, and blocking me from my fellows and keeping me from being of maximum service to the people in my life. And, um, you know, I, I get a, 
I, you know, sometimes people who remember me counting days or remember me in my first year will come up to me every once in a while and be like, you know, Christine, you're very different now. Because um, I, I just came in really dark and really toxic. And, and now they're like, wow, you're just so happy. And I just, and, and I sometimes don't know how to reconcile the two other than this program works. I have no idea why it works. Sometimes the only thing it has going for it is that it works. Um, so, um, yeah, I... And, and I don't mean to be funny because I do believe this is a serious thing, and, and we are not a glum lot. Um, but you know, I, you know, I just this program I, I, I'm very grateful for. And if you're new, if you're coming back, please stay. Um, thanks. Our second 10-minute speaker is Tom M. My name's Tom. I'm an alcoholic. <sighs> All right. Um, this is my home group. Uh, my sponsor is Dayton. I, uh, oh, my sobriety date, June 23rd, 05. And I just finished my first actual step four, I'd say. And I'm living in 10, 11, and 12. <clears throat> um, I'm from Manhattan. Grew up in Hell's Kitchen. Still live there. My mom is she uh, migrated here from Colombia when she was 20. My dad, raised in the Bronx, uh, he's Irish, and he drinks. Um, he's also a retired cop, but when I was a child, he was, you know, on the force. <sighs> um, okay. I was told I can't really screw this up because it's my life. I lived it, so... <clears throat> I, um, growing up, my mom, <laughs> my mom, um, the neighborhood wasn't, wasn't too nice, and so she never wanted me to really hang out with people around where I grew up, so she sent me to good schools, Upper East Side, um, that lasted a few years, I got to spend it a few times before fifth grade, and I, I told my mom that I really needed to transfer out because kids didn't like me there, and uh, teachers didn't like me. And she believed it. Uh, she always, I guess she always thought I was her little boy. I was the firstborn. So uh, she'd like to think that I was a really good kid. And I put on a good act most of the time in front of family. Um, I was really the first sibling in the family. Now it's huge. The Spanish side is just huge. It, it blew up lately. But I had, I, had, um, I had all the attention until I was about 12 or so. So... Uh, I always, I guess I was the class clown growing up, and junior high, I noticed that you had to be a little tough, so I kind of dropped that, tried being a tough kid, and this whole time, uh, I just remember, I remember the fridge being stocked with uh, Budweiser's, and my dad always drank, um, he was the first person I saw drunk, he he got loud sometimes, um, my mom always uh, sent me away during the summers so I wouldn't be home because I guess that's when it took off. And I remember when, I, forget, I think it was about 11 or 12, I got home and I was looking for something in my mom's drawer and I, I pulled out this sheet and it's, it was some kind of uh, court document that said something about domestic violence and I put two and two together and I knew what was going on. Uh, I went to high school, I went to an all-boys school downtown Catholic school, and um, I thought that's where I was going to learn how to be a man, um, but it's really here where I learned, uh, where I'm working on being a man. Uh, I got in with, I had a couple close friends, like three guys I was really close with, but for the most part I was jumping around between different cliques, different groups of kids. I hung out with the Rockaway kids on the weekends, hung out with Upper West Side kids during the week, during school. And I started drinking, I remember sipping my dad's beer every now and then, but I never really bought my own until I was 14, I think, or sophomore year of college, uh, high school. And it happened, um, it happened down in Stytown. Uh, the tradition is that like, the first Friday of the second month in my high school, there's a, a dance, and simultaneously there's also a keg um, in Stytown. And either you go to the dance or you go to the keg, or you go to the keg and then go to the dance, which is what I did. 
and that wasn't too good of an idea. But so we decided to drink before the before the keg, and I remember we were drinking in the stairwell, and we'd have to uh, we paid a homeless guy to get us the beer. And I remember lying to my friend saying, oh, I drink all the time. I'm going to take a six-pack myself. You guys do whatever you want. And so, what, I was like 5'1", 100 and something pounds. And so it was it was Coors Light. And I remember I, the six-pack was done in like 45 minutes. I remember trying to swallow it. It didn't go down so well. Um, I even took some of my friend's beers. I told him, you're not going to finish that. What are you doing? And uh, I got really, really drunk. And I was really, really happy. I remember run, running up and down the streets, um, in traffic, whatever. I'm not going to die, right? Um, and we showed up to the keg party, and I was just talking to all, all the girls. I was talking to the seniors I was scared of, and I thought, oh, wait, five minutes, wow. Um, so I got drunk. It was the weekends in high school, and I went away to school. Oh, the other thing, during the week, Monday would come. I was just thinking about the week, the past weekend, what I did. Um, and then Monday to Friday was all about what was happening Friday night. I didn't focus on school, none of that. And I went away to school for college. My mom wasn't around. My dad wasn't around. So I just was pretty reckless, never went to class, drank every day. I put on 40-something pounds before Christmas break. And... Um, I was getting a lot of fights, losing a lot of friends. It happened really fast. As soon as I got the freedom and I could drink the way I wanted, I was I was done for. And I remember this one, I guess like the first awakening I had was we were in the diner the morning after night out, and uh, one of my friends said, what are we going to do for the rest of our lives? And some friends were like, oh, I'm going to be a lawyer, I'm going to be a doctor, I'm going to work on Wall Street. And I just instinctively thought I'm going to make a lot of money and drink all the time. And um, that weekend, I decided to go home because I was feeling really down. And we went away to the Poconos, and I was going crazy. I couldn't drink. Uh, and I, I went into uh, my bedroom, and I just started crying. And it was the first time I cried in a very long time. I just thought I was going nowhere, and um, I was screwed. So I had a friend who uh, who I knew was an AA, and I didn't really ask about it, but he came back for Christmas break. and No, it was Thanksgiving break. And I asked him, I said, what's the deal with all that? And he goes, I don't drink. And I said, how about we just hang out together, you and me? We'll keep each other in check. We'll be all right. We won't drink too much. And he just laughed. He, he knew. He knew the game. And he was trying to get sober for a while, too. And uh, that night, I said, all right, man, I'm, I'm going to hang out with some friends. That was a really bad night. Got in a huge fight with my girlfriend. Got kicked out of the bar a couple times. Um, I really acted. I was, I don't know, out of character, I guess. The character defects were just flaring up and uh um i had a lot of those nights where i'd be the only one awake and all my friends were passed out and this was a good night i'd i'd be safe right but i just be drinking my face off and thinking this has to stop but you know not tonight and i uh i sought help i spoke to my friend i said you got to take me to one of those so i went thanksgiving night um i said my name's tom i'm an alcoholic and i got a sponsor I started calling him up. He didn't call me back. I said, forget this. Hey, it's, I'm not doing it. Um, I picked up some supplements to my drinking on a relapse, and it was pretty much over after that. So I found the Atlantic Group. I heard a few things about it. Uh, they weren't good things. That's why I came. And then, um, I don't know, it was, it, was, it was perfect. I mean, I love my home group. And I got a... I got a good sponsor. Uh, we worked together for a year. He was at my watch. And the whole, I don't know, most of my life I just wanted to fit in and be a part of. And I thought that what I was wasn't really acceptable to the group. Um, you take a look around. There's a lot of different people here, and we all fit in. It's a home group. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I've met a lot of great people here, um, people that I'd want to aspire to be like. And I never really, ha I never really had that in my life. It was always my drunk friends, my family, um, and I just, uh, I was relapsing a lot in the beginning, but that's because I wasn't doing what I, what was suggested. And um, suggestion, but you really should do it. It's like you're gonna drink probably if you don't. 
uh, I remember waiting around to uh, get a sponsor. I, was, I just wanted someone to come up to me and say, hey, I'm going to sponsor you. And I drank. Um, I drank over a lot of stuff, and it wasn't until I was willing to um, do the work that I could actually stay sober. I came to AA a lot of times for a lot of different reasons, trying to work out a relationship with a girlfriend, um, trying to make my mom happy. And uh, nothing nothing really ever made sense until I was honest with myself and another alcoholic. And I really can't believe I'm saying this stuff right now because this is totally not like me two years ago. Um, but uh, I've, I've really jumped in the steps lately because I, I felt like I was in a bad way the past uh, month. And so I did this fourth step, and I actually did it this time. Like Whatever popped into my head, I didn't try to rationalize the scenario. I just wrote it down, and it took a while, but I felt really good today. And I used to think those voices in your head and those great ideas that you come up with, that, that was your conscience, but it's not. It's, it's alcoholism, if you don't know it. And um, so, <laughs> so right now I'm, I have these gifts where... I, I can I can walk down the street and my mind's not going crazy. I have like, I have serenity, and I would not have that if I didn't work a program and um, read the big book and take direction from a sponsor. Um, I have a higher power today. I mean, I always had a higher power. I was I was forced to go to church, and that's how I I found mine. But you could find yours anywhere if you're a newcomer or whatever. Just get hooked up with someone. There's um there's like forty something stories in the back of the big book that tells you how people found God. And um, so if you're a newcomer, I guess uh, I wish you desperation. Um, you really got to hurt first, I think. And I hope you find God, and I hope uh, you end up all right. So thank you. And tonight our main speaker is D. My name is Dee and I am an alcoholic. Hi, everybody. My home group is the New Garden Group of Alcoholics Anonymous on West 31st Street between 7th and 6th, and you're all most welcome to come. We meet on Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday at 6. My sponsor's name is Joni, and my sobriety date is April 15th, 1983. I want to thank Helen for asking me to speak. It's a privilege and an honor to be at a group like this tonight. Let me tell you what I poured alcohol on top of. Um, the first hard evidence I have is a report card from first grade that my mother saved that has the comment, does not follow directions. <laughs> I was five. I was fascinated by alcohol and all the accoutrements, the tinkling ice and the foam on the top of my dad's beer and all that jazz, all, all growing up. Um, I developed an idea early on that, well, I remember specifically in junior high school standing at a window and thinking to myself that I knew pretty much everything that was important to know or I was on the verge of discovering it. Um, I was very isolated as a child. I was a Navy brat. We moved all the time. There was no continuity in my relationships, and things were pretty rough. And another old idea that I came into Alcoholics Anonymous with was a sense of uniqueness, that the things that happened to me as a child had only happened to me and not to anyone else. I had no idea. Um, my first, so, th you know, that's just to give you an idea of what alcohol had to work with when I started to drink. My first drunk was when I was 14. I went to a basketball game. It was one of the few occasions when I was social. My definition of social was to find the car of boys who had the trunk full of beer and to hang out with them all night and drink as much of it as I possibly could. I got really, really drunk, and something miraculous really happened. Um, they don't call it spirits for nothing, you know. I uh, I had a kind of a spiritual awakening 
when I got drunk the first time. I, I felt that all of my problems, and I was convinced that I had many problems, were solved. They were just solved by getting drunk. Now that's a real problem. Because if you think your problems are solved by getting drunk, I failed to develop skills and tools which would really solve my problems. I was surrounded by people who I, I remember at one point we were living in a house next to a girl my age who was studying to be a violinist, and she practiced five hours a day. It was just incredible. I had no clue about focus, about discipline. Um, well, no, I shouldn't say I had no clue about focus because I did have a focus. My focus was on the next drink. And that's what I pursued throughout my teenage years. My drinking was not particularly social. It was sort of hysterically funny a couple of times, you know, but mainly it was, uh, I was, it was, it was lonely, you know, but it was, the advantage of being alone when I drank was I didn't have to share and I didn't like to share. Um, at some point after high school, uh, I got very sick and I ended up in a series of psychiatric hospitals. Um, I don't think that's a particularly important part of my story except to say that I noticed when I came into AA that almost everybody had a reason why they felt different. And I'm just telling you my reason. You know, I, I didn't go to college. I went to St. Elizabeth's outside of Washington, D.C., which was a state institution. And, uh, uh, by the way, I hope to be graduating from college this summer. So a lot of things have changed. <laughs> um, and that's the power of, that's the power of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, so, when I got out of all those hospitals where I had not had a drink for a long time, and by the way, did not find a solution to my problems, uh, I picked up a drink again with a fierceness and a desperation that was just very intense. Because at this point, Getting drunk was not about having fun. Uh, getting drunk was my medicine. I needed this. This was my medicine. This was the stuff, the glue that was holding me together and uh, enabling me to function um, just barely, I have to say. Um, I'll tell you that toward the end of my drinking, uh, I didn't drink in bars. It just killed me to walk into a bar and spend four dollars. I don't know what it is now, but four dollars on a on a on a glass full, not even full, really, when I could buy a bottle and didn't have to talk to anybody. You know. So I had a shoulder bag and I didn't realize until I heard another gal qualify why the bag the strap was always breaking because it was it was very heavy. I had to equip myself as I was going out into the world. I had my pint of Clan McGregor. I had a bottle of Maalox, which I had to treat myself with before I took a slug of the Clan McGregor. I had a bottle of extra strength Tylenol, which I took by the fistfuls, and just the rattle of those pills in the bottle made me feel better. And I also, this is peculiar to me, I also carried a hardcover book. Now, it had been a long time since I'd been able to read a book, but I carried one because I calculated that if you saw me, particularly with a hardcover book, you would think I was very intelligent. And somehow this was part of the deal, you know, this was important to me. I did most of my drinking while I was out and about in bathrooms. Um, I had a another spiritual awakening about the sign employees must wash hands. 
but I didn't write it down, so I don't know what it is today. Um, I remember walking up toward therapy along Central Park West and getting to Tavern on the Green that has the lights all around the trees. And th this was a good night, thinking to myself, the trees are all lit up and so am I. <laughs> and I found that so amusing, you know. That's when I was sort of my best company. Um, so I would leave the job that I was barely holding on to, and I would uh, go to the store, and I would buy a gallon or a half gallon of whiskey. And uh, I remember walking out of the store with the bottle in my arms and thinking to myself, this is my baby, you know? And I'd go home, and I would, these were my favorite sounds, kicking the door shut, throwing the bolt, and thunking the bottle down on my counter. By the way, when I flipped the light, whoosh, the roaches, just the whole floor moved, you know. Um, I drank out of a glass that had a permanent film at the bottom of it, and occasionally... Uh, I would find uh, a roach floating in the water. You know, I'd leave it in the sink. And I'd just throw it out because I, I, I didn't use soap or anything because I figured alcohol is an antiseptic, right? So I didn't have to worry about that. And I would drink. And if it was a good night, a particularly good night, I would take the a bill I hadn't paid, an envelope, and I'd make a list of things I wanted to do. And I would have that feeling just for a few minutes that I was going to change my life. I was going to change my life. Things were going to be different. And I would write down things like, read the classics, you know. Uh, go to the theater. You know, I lived where Tom grew up in Hell's Kitchen. And... Uh, I was surrounded by New York City life, and I was participating in it primarily by sitting in the toilet, having revelations about the signage. Um, I did carry, at one point, I did decide that I was going to stop drinking by reading Moby Dick. I bought a, an expensive classic edition of Moby Dick, with illustra special illustrations and so forth. And I would ride the train home sweating and trembling and thinking to myself about the bottle of scotch that was behind the waste paper basket on the floor. But before I drank, I had to read a chapter of Moby Dick. And if you've ever read Moby Dick, you know that there are a lot of well, he gets off the subject very easily. <laughs> he talks about how they make harpoons and oil barrels, and, and you're just, you're dying, you know. You're saying, Herman, please just tell the story, you know. Um, it's really a blessing that it's funny today. You know, because it wasn't funny then. I mean, I would drink and I would drink until I passed out like I did every night. And, and I would um, wake up with a feeling that people had walked through my mouth in their socks, you know. And uh, I would try and brush my teeth and I would gag. Uh, and occasionally, you know, I'd puke and it would just be bile. And... Uh, and I would wonder why I had woken up. You know, I didn't know uh, what the point was. Uh, at some point when I was still social with my drinking, I was hanging out with a classical voice teacher uh, who made pictures of Bloody Marys on Sunday. And I was his first customer. And he'd say, have another Bloody Mary, baby. And I'd go, okay, you know, and uh, I spent a lot of time with this guy who was a self-admitted lush, uh, but had a real love for music. And uh, I was hanging out with people 
who had aspirations. Yeah. And I was telling them that I was writing a book. You know. Uh, one night, n now, I don't think the particulars of any drunk story are that important, but I will tell you that this triggered the most intense drinking toward the end of my drinking, and that was um, that I was over at this fellow's house one night, and he invited some people over, and they went down the hall to the back bedroom, and uh, eventually I fell asleep, the guests left, and I woke up in the morning, and he was dead, uh, and they had murdered him. Um, I think it had something to do with sex and maybe some dope on the street. I don't know. I was not really involved in that part of his life. But a detective handed me a very tall water glass full of scotch and said, here, baby, this will help you. And at that point, now I had been drinking daily for several years at that point. But right at that moment, my drinking became 24-hour round-the-clock drinking. I could not go for more than two hours without a drink, without starting to sweat and shake and shiver and be really sick and feel like it was just another goddamn day. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to curse. Um, so what happened? I saw, I was standing in my room one day with the, with the blinds closed because I hated the sunlight. It reminded me of happy people. You people, actually. That's what the world really came down to at that point in my life. There was me, who I thought a lot about. Not much of, but a lot about. And then there was you people. Uh, like Christine was talking about, that separation. And um, I heard of... It wasn't an audio voice. It was a thought in my head that didn't come from me. And it said, you are an alcoholic. That was a gift. And I said, I knew. I thought to myself, I know I'm an alcoholic. And I saw a sign not long after that on a bus that said, does someone you love have a problem with alcohol? And it was a picture of people like you guys, smiling, dressed nicely, clean, you know, standing on the stoop of a sunny brownstone. And this was, this was how, um, how I solved problems or how I looked for solutions. I looked at that picture and that brownstone and I thought to myself, if I can just get myself there, they will invite me in and let me live there and they'll take care of me. And that was the best I could cook up in terms of help. You know, help to me was total rescue. I needed to be rescued. I was dying. So I talked, it turned out to be an ad for the National Council on Alcoholism. Uh, and they asked me why I didn't go to AA and I said, I don't know why. Should I go to AA? <laughs> and they said, yes, we think so. They sent me down. Um, Intergroup was in the Flatiron Building at that time, and uh, I took the bus down there, and I stood behind outside the door, and it was a very, it had a very heavily frosted, heavy glass window, and my heart was kicking in my chest. And I could feel the sweat just trickling down my sides. My mouth was really dry, and I was scared to death. I had no idea what was on the other side of that door. And then more grace just trickled in, you know. And I put my hand on the knob, and I opened the door. And the door opened, and this little lady named Mary invited me to come in, a little Irish lady that was working there at the time. She sat me down. She brought me half a cup of coffee, which I thought was so thoughtful. And then I wondered, how does she know why I'm here? You know. I mean, I, 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 I shudder to think what I looked like at the time. You know, I didn't bathe very often. I had one pair of jeans and a couple of shirts, and I was pale. I was malnourished. Um, 
I had scars on my wrists. You know, the whole, the whole nine yards. Um, a fellow there at the, at the desk, uh, told me his story, which I had no idea why he was telling me these things. It really didn't make any, I didn't make any connection with it at all. And of course I was a little buzzed, you know, um, and, but I thought he was quite nice. That, that was my impression of you guys. I thought you were really very nice and very sincere. And, uh, he asked if I would like someone to call me and I said, yes, I would. And, uh, I gave him my number and I went home and I did what I did every night. I finished the job, you know, until I passed out. And the phone rang in the morning, which was a very rare, rare thing. I picked it up and John H. was on the other lo- other end. And he said to me in a gravelly voice like John Wayne, would you like to meet me at a meeting? And I thought that was the nicest thing anyone had said to me in a long time. An actual invitation. I hadn't been invited anywhere for a long time. My friends had long since gotten sick of my act. So I met John at Fireside. That was my first meeting. I went to the beginner's room. I listened to a an international reporter tell his story. I was uh, set upon by a, a buzzing cloud of women who were flapping phone numbers in front of my face, and uh, I had no idea what they wanted. I just wanted them to get away. Um, John and the speaker spent the entire rest of the day with me, and this is where I like to just mention the love that has no price tag in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I am sure, as I look back on it now, that those guys had other plans for that day. I'm sure they did. Things that they would have enjoyed much more than hanging out with me. But they took me to a sidewalk cafe and bought me iced tea and let me just sit there and start to shake it out. And they chatted among themselves. And I thought, isn't this nice? I thought that they were actually spending time with me because I was so charming, you know. I was practically incapable of speech. Uh, and they sat with me for hours. They sat with me for hours. And that was really, you know, they, they walked me home. They asked me if I had any alcohol in the house. Uh, I did. We poured it out. John said to me, I lived on Ninth Avenue and, uh, uh, in the forties. And John said to me, well, here's the address of Allen on house, which was in that neighborhood at the dawn. And he said, there's a meeting at 6 o'clock, and I want you to go there and ask for a woman named Kathy. And that's how my journey began in Alcoholics Anonymous. I walked in. You were all so cheerful and repetitive, you know. (laughs) Keep coming back, you know. And, you know, and kind. And... um But remember, I thought I was unique. Um, and I thought, and I, 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 it says somewhere here in the book, Dr. Silkworth talks about problems that pile up until they're almost just, it's impossible to think of any kind of a solution. And that's how it was with me. I was about to lose a job. If I lost the job, I lost the room. If I lost the room, I was on the street and I heard women during the crack epidemic being raped under stoops on my street. I was scared to death to be on the street. I knew alcohol was a problem, but I was a certified psychiatric patient. How could, you know, I would say to people in AA, you don't understand, I'd say, I'm crazy. (laughs) And they would do what you just did. They'd laugh and they'd say, we just, just come tomorrow, D, okay? You know, um, Okay, so I came to meetings. I did what um, a lot of people say to do. I didn't drink most of the time, and I came to meetings. Um, I did not take suggestions. Uh, and periodically, when I got angry enough, uh, bitter enough, cynical enough, bratty enough, you know, I'd pick up a drink. And, uh, 
But there was nowhere left for me to go. I mean, I'd done the psychiatric hospital thing, you know, to its limit, really. There was nothing else to, to discover down that road. This was the last house on the block. So I always came back to AA. Um, I got to a holiday weekend in September, and I had not had a drink since April. Uh, by the way, it's summertime, and you might be thinking of how pretty those glasses of beer look with the condensation and so forth. My last drink was a cold 45, and it, think about how it comes back up through your nose, warm and greenish and thin. And uh, I couldn't move my head out of the way, you know, so I was covered with it. And that's the kind of degradation I felt at the end of my drinking. So I managed a few months just going to meetings, um, not drinking. And I developed an attitude. And my attitude was sort of, you know, hand on my hip, sort of, okay, I'm not drinking, you know. You told me not to drink. I'm not drinking. I want to die. I want to die. I can't stand myself. I, I can't see my way clear at all. Now, I had saved... Uh, uh, some handfuls of psychiatric medications and I had gone to the drugstore and bought some sleeping pills and I uh, took them on a weekend where I, I imagine that all you people were off on your boats. You know, that was my idea. Each of you in couples, you know, like Noah's Ark, you know, going off on this... Uh, uh, and I was desperately lonely. And I couldn't see my way through another day. And I took two handfuls of these pills, and I went into a coma. That was a Saturday night. I vaguely remember having convulsions. I was conscious enough to sense myself bouncing around on the mattress. Uh, and I finally came to on a Tuesday morning. Um, I did not choke on my own vomit like Christine was talking about, you know. Um... I realized some very important things as I came to that morning. Uh, one was that I had not wanted to die. I realized I didn't want to die. I was glad I woke up. You know, and I also realized that I did not know how to live without alcohol. I just, I did not have a clue how to live without alcohol. And I also realized that I had a very strong justified resentment against my parents. And here I was, a 30-year-old woman living in a roach-infested tenement apartment, and whose fault was that? And I was, I was finally able to start to take responsibility for myself. I was like the guy it talks about in Dr. Silkworth's chapter who... Um, goes and hides in a barn. You know, he's at the end of his drinking. He can't drink anymore. He can't kill himself. He's at the jumping off place, and he goes and he hides in a barn like a little kid. And they send out a search party, and they find him. And uh, he comes back sometime later to visit Dr. Silkworth. And Silkworth says, I had the feeling that I'd met this guy before, but... But on the other hand, I didn't recognize him at all. He says, this guy has had a complete psychic change. Well, I have had a complete psychic change. And how that occurred was I found a sponsor who was familiar with this book and took me through the steps. We read it together. We actually read it together because I had a sponsee who I thought really needed it. That was how I operated, you know, a little precocious, oh, I know, you know, but I don't really need that, but I know somebody who really does. And it changed my life. Uh, we read it together whenever it said to do something, we did it. I took, I wouldn't say it was a fearless inventory, I was scared when I did it, but like Tom did, you know, I did it anyway. And I discovered things, things that I thought were funny, my sponsor didn't find funny at all. And things I felt terrible about, my sponsor said, that's normal. Anybody would have done that, you know? And so I started to let in some information. I started to realize I didn't know I needed help. 
And the most profound thing I did, and Christine was talking about this, was I um, got to those amends. And I had the perception that there were other people in the world besides me and that I had had an effect on them. You know, I just came this weekend from visiting my two twin nieces who are four months old. And I can't tell you what a pleasure that is. But if this were the old days and if I had not come to Alcoholics Anonymous and taken the steps as prescribed, I would have missed the whole deal. I just would have missed it. Well, my life is so full today. I have a power greater than my own thinking, thank God, that loves me. And I'm really clear. I, I don't want to give you the impression that I know every minute exactly what I'm doing, but I do know why I'm here. I'm here to be of service, you know, and to take all the love that's been given to me over these many years and to try and be a conduit and just give that back. Uh, I want to say to Yvonne and all the people who are counting days, my sponsor taught me a very simple prayer. She taught me two prayers, and I'll end with this. One of them was whenever I saw a, an ad, you know, that makes the liquor look so pretty, or I walked past a liquor store. I shouldn't put that in the past tense. Whenever I see these things, I say automatically, Dear God, come between me and the thought of a drink. And I have not had a drink for a long time. And the other prayer she left me with was, Just turn your face to the light. That's all that's necessary. There's darkness, and then there's light. And if you make the slightest move toward the light, you'll be pulled along. So I'm very grateful to be here. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.